Eric, if there was, you know, one film that kind of encapsulated who we are, what we're about, what the Iron Cult would uh, be about, would it be by a director with a name like Kurosawa, Tarkovsky, Fellini, Chaplin, Kubrick? What, 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 where, where are you leaning here? Larissa Shapiko, we're going a little bit more esoteric. Where, what, do you, what, do you, what represents us? I don't know. Maybe two protagonists. Okay. Um, bonded in, in their mission. Yeah. Um, bonded in their, their goals. Uh, I would almost say like physically stuck together uh, in, in whatever their mission might be. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you can think of any appropriate movies that would might, I don't know, serve as, as an emblematic kind of uh, example of that. You know, I do feel we're stuck together. I feel that one of us would certainly, if there was a movie adaptation of us, would be certainly played by Matt Damon and the other by another well-known, relatively well-known Hollywood actor. Um, mm. I do feel that this episode, if we're going with the movie theme, is honestly kind of like one of our faves where we actually did bond through the emotional pain we suffered. Hereditary, where at first you're like, okay, like what's, like, what's actually going on here? So here, here's the flow of this episode. You think, oh, they're getting awfully pedantic talking about these things, like body uh, composition, measurement tools, uh, two-factor set. Like, who, who gives a shit? How is this relevant? And then at the end, the horror that's unleashed on you where we have our boy, Dr. Cody Hahn, just go level 10. He he fully goes, I'm just going to say, it. I'm not trying to make the Star Trek boys and the Star Trek uh, girls fight against this uh, Star Wars lad and uh, ladies, but he went Obi-Wan uh, Kenobi mode, okay, where it's like he seems mm -hmm. like just this desert traveler, kind of this mystic, and then by the end, he ascends. Absolutely. No, we... Uh... What we what we envisioned as a uh, oh how interesting episode about body composition and you know correcting some of the the little uh, things that we get wrong in the evidence based community kind of similar to our episode with Chris Barricat on body composition mm. became a a, a mind bending di deep dive into into all things adipose tissue all things skeletal muscle and then finding out how distinct things like fat free mass lean body mass, all the way from two to five compartment models, which ones are necessary, propagation of errors, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, even questioning the way we see <laughs> mitochondria, uh, believe it or not, uh, by the time we reticulum we this, this episode. It, apparently, <laughs> you know, you thought it was just a sarcoplasmic reticulum. No, uh, my goodness, uh, the, the, the organelles are even in question in this episode. Uh, but in all seriousness, I was actually just really overjoyed by how this episode went. Um, for as 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 Omar mentioned, we had Dr. Cody Hahn on, uh, who did did a lot of great work uh, at Lagrange College as a researcher assistant. Uh, did his graduate work with Dr. Mike Roberts. Um, he is, in my opinion, one of the leading uh, figures in skeletal muscle physiology and uh, understanding uh, body composition as it relates to that. Uh, and, you know, he also does great work. I think he, uh, his own company is Fitomics LLC. I want to make sure I get that right. Shout out uh, if I got it wrong to me for being a moron. But nonetheless, he, you can find him on Instagram. Make sure you follow this guy, Dr. Cody Hahn. He is a true expert in, the, in his field. And um, he, he was joined by another expert and another person who really complemented his expertise quite well, Dr. Grant Tinsley, who's over at Texas Tech. Uh, and he's done a lot of notable research in recent years um, on time-restricted feeding, which, hint, hint, may result in him coming back on the podcast. But today, he was talking about body composition. And he's done a lot of research looking at different compartment models, understanding the composition of different tissues. And before we even got to the earth-shattering experience of, uh, of Dr. Hahn dropping the anvil on us and helping us understand skeletal muscle... He gave us a, uh, a master class on adipose tissue and how, oh my God, fat isn't actually fat. Who knew uh, what it is composed of and the various ways we can measure it, uh, the various ways we think it's changing or maybe not changing what it actually is. And also we, we, we gave some really good, I would say, clarification to some of what Chris Barricat talked about when we started to talk about the various ways which body composition can be observed. Uh, the magnitudes of change in different compartments and how they might come out as being measured differently 
if you were to have someone measured on two different devices. So honestly, it's all here, folks. And uh, and yeah, I just I just I thought it was an awesome episode. <sighs> Eric, this is also an episode where it's kind of a full circle moment where we're, when we initially spoke about the concept of us doing Iron Culture, you kind of said to me, it's like, man, well, you know, we could get your favorite experts expert. You know, most people, they'll interview, they'll get a science communicator in the space. Like, let's get him to talk about the research of X person. And one of the things you said is like, let's just do the deep dive and get the actual researchers. So you've probably heard reference these names before on Iron Culture and on other, you know, uh, podcast platforms, YouTube, online, so on and so forth. Google scholars citing their research. Like, let's just talk to them directly. So it's kind of a, a cool full circle moment because, you know, a dedicated Iron Cult member could probably list and count the number of times we've referenced work that have included these two individuals and their names. And now we have them on. And guess what? By the end, I won't say your head will be uh, uh, blown off, but, you know, there'll be a separation of head and body. At that, You'll have an out-of-body experience. Is that fair to say, Eric? It is fair to say. And, <laughs> and you know, some people have a negative view of not having a head. but Not us. I have it on, on good authority. Yeah. Um, I'd say, like king level uh <laughs> authority uh that 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 things can still work pretty well even without a head you might still have a very dedicated purpose in life um we and honestly purpose yeah yeah what is iron culture about if not changing everything below your neck anyway <sighs> eric you beautiful human i'm going to say four statements and each statement i want you to evaluate it and just say whether it's true or false is that fair always <sighs> okay first one Pain don't hurt much. True. Okay, yeah. Either I don't know if it's Barbell Medicine or Dalton from Roadhouse who said it, but cool. Two, fat is fat. False. Okay, okay. Now, three, muscle is muscle. That I'll say is true. If, now, if you'd said muscle is protein, I might have given you a different answer, but I'm going to say true for that okay. one. Four, I was at your 2011 bodybuilding show. I want to welcome our two guests. We have uh, Dr. Grant Tinsley and Dr. Cody Hahn on with us today. Um, what they lack in hair follicles, they more than make up for in accolades. And uh, these two gentlemen, first, I just want to say a big thank you to you both. Um, and they're going to help us answer two of those four questions. Actually, I only heard three. I think my mic, uh, your mic cut out or something. So two of those three Dude, questions yeah. today about really... Is muscle muscle, or is muscle just protein, or what the hell is muscle, and what is fat? How do we measure it? And I think this will be an excellent companion episode to everyone who listened to uh, our episode on body recomposition with Chris Barricat. So first, I'm going to start in order of who's wearing a white shirt. Uh, Grant Tinsley, could you introduce us uh, to yourself and, and let, 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 the, let, let the guests of Iron Culture, which is the cult as we refer to them uh, with, with fondness, <laughs> know a little bit about your expertise, who you are, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first, thanks for having me on. Thanks to the cult for listening to this episode. Um, I am an assistant professor at Texas Tech University. Um, I'm in my fifth year here, so I did my uh, PhD at Baylor University. Uh, prior to that, uh, I direct the Energy Balance and Body Composition Laboratory. So a lot of the work we do pertains to body composition and some of the topics we'll get into here. Um, we have an interest in resistance training, so any of our studies with an exercise component, we focus on uh, exclusively on resistance training. We do some sports nutrition work as well. Um, a really great great team of um, doc students, master students, and and undergraduate students as well. So, yeah, we have fun. We like to crank out the research, and yeah, happy to be chatting with you guys tonight. Oh, we're we're ecstatic to have you on. Um, you've you've contributed so much to the to the research community in the last uh, more than five years. Uh, but most recently in the last five, of course. And uh, I think you've done some great work in a lot of topics. Hint, hint, Iron Colt. He may be, he may be, may be back on in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, just really appreciate your expertise. Next up, uh, we have Dr. Cody Hahn. Introduce yourself, please. How are you doing? Well, I am doing better now that I'm chatting with you guys. Cool. Uh, I am Dr. Cody Allen. That's the introduction, I guess. <laughs> would you like for me to share a little bit about what I do, Eric? I would love that. If you if you could try to emulate what your white shirt wearing colleague did, uh, I think that would be a, a perfect symmetry to this episode. Excellent. 
Well, so I studied exercise science in undergraduate studies and master studies and for my PhD. Uh, during my PhD, I focused in on skeletal muscles specifically. I was in Dr. Mike Roberts' lab, um, and he basically runs a molecular biology lab that digs into underlying mechanisms uh, that explain uh, adaptations that we see to, to training and different nutrition interventions and, and supplementation strategies. So effectively trying to understand mechanisms. And while I was there, um, I got really interested in how muscles grow. Um, of course, my, my interest started earlier in my uh, teenage years, right? Uh, reading muscle magazines and, and really getting into training. <clears throat> but I really uh, dialed in on that area during my PhD and also studied um, individual responses. So, and really the variability in responses to training. So we would take 30 or so college age men um, in a, the studies that we did at Auburn and inevitably all of them would respond a little bit differently. And I got really interested in why that was the case. So what are the physiological differences between some of the individuals that didn't gain any muscle in response to the training intervention we used versus some of the, the subjects that gained a lot of muscle mass, uh, at least theoretically muscle mass, right, Grant? Mm -hmm. Got to be careful yeah. with our terms here. Um, so, yeah, that, that variability was really interesting to me. So I, I continued that research for a couple of years at LaGrange College uh, as a professor and a researcher. And then now uh, I've decided to transition out of academia um, and continue exploring those areas uh, in my own research practice. And, and so I'm doing testing and, and research uh, for in-person clients here in, in Alabama now and really focusing my efforts full-time on this, uh, trying to understand how to best individualize training and nutrition for people. I love it. And uh, I think uh, I think you guys, like, like, we, like we mentioned off-air, um, you guys have excellent skill sets and expertises to complement one another. And Omar, I'm thinking uh, we actually kicked this off with getting right into that that first question, which I gave perhaps an answer that cocked the eyebrows of many a cult listener, uh, mm. that, that fat may not just be fat. So I'm going to kick this over to you two gentlemen. Adipose tissue and fat. Synonyms? So they're not synonyms. There is certainly overlap um, between those two entities. But even just saying fat, um, there is not absolute agreement on what that means. So in some of the body composition literature, that would be defined specifically as triglyceride. In other areas, it'd be defined as a, well, in other areas, fat would be considered a synonym for lipid, which would be not only triglyceride, but phospholipids, cholesterol, um, et cetera. So really, as it's generally used, though, um, fat and body composition methods usually refers to molecular fat. Um, so molecules of fat, again, debate on is this only molecules of triglycerides or all lipid molecules. Um, so that those fat molecules, though, whichever way you define it, can occur anywhere in the body. So we're talking about just the molecules wherever they exist. Adipose tissue, in contrast, is something that you could physically dissect off of someone. So I like thinking about cadavers. I dissected cadavers for a year. It was a lot of fun. I could physically dissect off the adipose tissue. That could be weighed out. You could chemically um, dissect it as well, of course. But if you're talking about an actual anatomical entity, you can visualize um, that. That would be adipose tissue. A large portion of adipose tissue is molecular fat. Um, so estimated, it can vary. Estimated around 80%, but it can vary substantially, um, about 60 to 90%, I believe. Um, so there, there is overlap in those two entities, but mostly, most of the methods we use, for example, in my lab and, and that likely many uh, listeners would be familiar with, most of those are estimating molecular fat, not adipose tissue. Interesting. So first I want to say that uh, I love to hear that you're really interested in, in cadavers 
Um, I kind of wish that, that Danny Len was on this episode. We have had other experts in dead bodies on previously. Um, you're both probably wondering what that's alluding to. And trust me, you don't want to know. Don't explore uh, it. But we'll just, yeah, we don't, don't, don't look into that if you want to keep looking um, in general. But we'll come back to that. So I, I've, I've often joked, and you'll often hear when you take like a body composition class, probably especially at the, like the graduate level and an exercise science or nutrition program, that the only true way to have an accurate representation of your body fat percentage is dissection. And I think that speaks a little bit to what you were saying is to actually, you know, physically remove the fat from your body and weigh it. Uh, and that is true of like your adipose tissue, but obviously some of those other structures that have phospholipids in them wouldn't be a part of that. Um, so if adipose tissue, Grant, is only 60 to 90% fat, well, what the heck is the rest of it? Yeah, so primarily water and then also some protein. So if you think about, you know, the say the cells, the dipocytes that comprise adipose tissue, they're, they're cells like other cells you've learned about. I mean, they're specialized in certain ways, but um, they need to have that um, cell membrane, which, you know, of course has the phospholipid component, but has proteins. Um, there is fluid, of course, within the, the cell as well. So yeah, from a molecular standpoint, mostly protein, water, and then the actual fat or lipid content. Love it. So here, here's an interesting question. And I think there was actually a paper, uh, if I recall correctly, Lena Key was on it, uh, that, that I think the title basically alluded to there are obligatory losses of lean body mass uh, when you lose pure adipose tissue. So can you explain that? So if, if, if adipose tissue has a component of it that is protein, does that mean that we'll see quote unquote lean body mass losses via certain measurements of body composition, even if you lose purely body fat. Yeah. So this would be, this would be true of other methods, but that paper, that short communication was talking specifically about DEXA, um, dual energy X-ray absorptiometry, uh, for anyone who's uh, not familiar with the acronym. And, uh, it was a short communication. It was really interesting, but yeah, as you mentioned, they use some existing, um, previously collected data looking at large magnitudes of weight loss and, Essentially, what they reported is, is similar to what you said and relates to the previous question. As people lost, uh, reduced the mass of adipose tissue on their body, they not, o- not only lost the lipid, primarily triglyceride, but lost some of the associated water and potentially protein content, but, but definitely the water. So they essentially applied a correction factor to some of these dextra measurements, and they were concluding that some of this lean body mass loss we see with weight loss um, which in absence of exercise, that's very consistently seen with large weight loss, you lose some amount of, you know, so-called lean mass and then of course fat as well. Um, so they said once they corrected for that, you essentially, that sort of knocked out the lean body mass loss. So they were kind of putting forth the idea that you might not actually have this concerning loss of functional lean mass or say muscle mass if we're bridging to a different concept there. Um, but that it would appear that way just given what the DEXA was actually assessing. Got it. So can we, I, I guess, you know, when, when we hear sometimes scientific findings or, or like blogs in the fitness community, it often is hyperbolic. Would it be an overstatement to say that perhaps because of this aspect of fat loss on a very common metric uh, that we use to assess body composition using DEXA, that lean body mass losses are overblown when people go through dieting? I think that might be overstating it a little bit. The data they used, I don't remember the exact magnitude off the top of my head, but it was a very large um, magnitude of weight loss. And there were a few other um, specific aspects of the data that I don't think there was anything wrong with it. But looking at it, I don't know if you could broadly apply it. And if, if I recall correctly, they presented it with the appropriate nuance. Um, and it definitely stimulated thought. Uh, as an interesting side note, last year we did an overfeeding study in my lab where we essentially tried to get people to gain as much weight as possible. And one of our abstracts, um, the the title of their paper was like, body fat loss automatically reduces the lean component of DEX or something like that. We had the exact same title, but we reversed it. It's like body fat gain automatically, um, whatever the reverse of the whole title was. So we, we kind of looked at it from the opposite aspect and we didn't have the same magnitude of weight gain as they had a weight loss because they were looking at very substantial weight loss. But um, it can kind of go in, in both directions. And again, just speaks to what DEXA is actually assessing versus what we conceptualize. So DEXA is assessing, you know, molecules of fat. DEXA is not explicitly accounting for water, but we often think through the lens of adipose tissue and muscle mass because they are things we're familiar with that we can tell where those things are in our own body. 
or we've seen them, we've seen them on anatomy charts and so on. So I think there's sometimes a little bit of disconnect between those different levels of assessment. Grant, well, Eric, sorry. Go ahead, yeah. Omar. I, this is the first I'm hearing of an overfeeding study. And let me just personally say that, uh, Grant, the next one that comes up, I would like to volunteer, you know, for the betterment of society, humanity, exercise, science. Um, I, I will eat a lot of food for the sake of, you know, science. If you need more people, because I know I heard from Eric that often when it comes to recruiting subjects for studies, it's hard. So I just want to do my part. I appreciate it. You'll be the first person we call when we do overfeeding study part two. Thank you. Uh, also, Omar, on that note, I want to apologize to you because the last time uh, you went through a, I guess I'd say a non-scientific overfeeding period, <laughs> right? what I would typically just call <laughs> self-experimentation. You know, weeks, right. Yeah. Yeah. Self-experimentation or just your, your standard life. Um, yeah. I said, I don't think you gained any muscle. Yeah. And while I don't think you gained any muscle, I guess it would be true technically, Grant, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. that he might have gained some lean mass. Yeah, if he was gaining pure adipose tissue, then by a lot of assessment methods, he would have gained some amount of fat-free mass or lean mass, yes. Yeah. I, Man, that, yeah. you just reframed every dreamer bulk I've ever made fun <laughs> of on the bodybuilding.com forums yeah. back in like the mid-2000s. Like, I think I've been way too harsh on these people. They gained a ton of lean mass, yeah. Yeah. bro. I feel I feel vindicated because it felt solid to me when I would touch it. You know, I was doing Cody. Uh, you're probably not aware of this, but Eric was coaching me and I would do weekly weigh ins and I was, you know, doing a recomp. Right. I was losing fat and I was uh, leaning out and every week it'd go like 182 next week, 184.3 week after that, 186.7 all the way up to 198.4. And I'm like, Eric, this is the craziest body recomp anyone's ever experienced. Like I am getting shredded here and I'm building like 20, 30 pounds of muscle. And he said, dude, no, I guarantee that's all fat. And I said, Eric, feel this right here. This is all solid beef. Um, and so just to hear once again, that you can accumulate as you know, body weight fluctuates, some lean mass, lean tissue, dude, th th this is going to be life changing for uh, dreamer bulks. I think perhaps just like my statement might have taken it too far. I think maybe that's another example of that. But I think the take home, Omar, mm. is that adipose tissue does have a protein con uh, content and, and a water content. So I was wanting to go next into some of the, uh, the, the content of muscle, but I think we've kind of got this natural segue into some of the measurement techniques that we have for assessing body composition. So, uh, so Grant, and, and of course, Cody, chime in at any point where you think you've got something to add to the conversation. Um, I would love to hear some of the measurement techniques we have and how people can can better differentiate between like skeletal muscle mass, lean mass, fat free mass, uh, adipose tissue versus you know uh, fat. Like so, how can we see if we're actually uh, losing or gaining the tissue we're attempting to lose or gain? Yeah, I think we have. I, I can start with the kind of whole body stuff we do in my lab, Cody, and then we, you could probably chime in with the more impressive stuff that you have expertise in. Um, as a side note, someone following up on this, Cody is first author on an excellent paper in 2019 that is required reading for one of my grad classes about skeletal muscle assessment. And it includes some of the whole body stuff that we do here, but gets into the very nitty gritty of um, the nuance of skeletal muscle. So it's a really fantastic paper. I hadn't told you that before, Cody, but it's required reading for my class. I read it last week because they were reading it. So um, I, I'm happy to just start though. Uh, I need to give a little bit of background. So body composition, um, this was in the early 90s, was sort of laid out and defined at these five levels. So each level sort of builds on the previous levels. And the assessment methods we use are usually mostly confined to a certain level, um, though you can do sort of indirect prediction between levels. So to define what those are, the first level would be the atomic level. So if we're talking about the atoms in the body, Next level would be the molecular level. So molecules in the body, you can tell, you know, in this conversation, we've been talking about that some already. We've been talking about protein, fat, water, and so on. Um, after that, you have the cellular level. So this would be where you'd have concepts um, like fluid outside of the cells, fluid inside of the cells, and so on. Um, then you have the organ slash tissue slash system level. Um, this tissue level is the one that people tend to think in, I believe this is where skeletal muscle tissue would be. This is where adipose tissue would be. And then the final level would be whole body. Um, and that would largely relate to anthropometry um, and different just sort of whole body um, assessments. So the majority of those, the majority of the common assessments we see are more or less in the molecular 
um, model. So again, they're predicting molecular flat fat, not necessarily um, adipose tissue. So common examples for you know that we have in our lab would be um, air displacement plethysmography. Um, so that's sort of it, the the more in vogue version um, densitometric method. So previously it was underwater weighing. Um, we have a variety of bioimpedance techniques. So singular. So that's that's the uh, that's the dunk tank and the bod pod for those listening. Yep. Yep, dunk tank, bod pod. I got you. Um, we have various bioelectrical techniques. So the the consumer grade bioelectrical te techniques, you know, many listeners might be familiar with. Those would be the the cheap body fat scales you could get at Walmart, the little handheld Omron body fat device that's sitting around in the closet of every fitness center. Um, but then they go up to to pretty nice devices that are ten or fifteen thousand dollars that employ multiple frequencies that um, are well validated um, against what's called a multi compartment model, which which we may get into. So bioelectrical techniques. Um, DEXA, we have some 3D scanners, which are sort of their own thing, but most of these common assessment methods are using the molecular level and they're using what's called a two compartment model. So all, if we view all of our body mass as one compartment, like that's all your body mass. If we split it into two compartments, that's fat mass, that's fat free mass. You can get your body fat percentage here. This is where almost all methods that people are exposed to, um, would, um, reside, including things like skin folds. So if you have someone who's doing something like skin fold calipers, um, those raw thicknesses would be plugged into an equation that was built based on a two compartment model and you'll get your fat mass and fat-free mass. So what these are actually assessing or estimating, very much estimating, would be molecules of fat and molecules of everything else. So molecules of fat, everything else includes what it says, everything else. So the water the protein, mineral, glycogen, and so on. So there's not a lot of resolution within that compartment. But what most of these are doing are trying to estimate fat mass or the opposite, try to estimate all of fat-free mass and then the remaining uh, remainder of body mass is is fat mass. No, that's really helpful. I think talking about the different levels from atomic to molecular all the way up to tissue and then full and then whole body. And then also talking about the different compartments from two, three, four compartment model. I think is a really important background that we can dive into. I think one useful way to conceptualize why these importance are these differences are, are important and not just academic or pedantic, uh, Cody, um, Doctor Han. So you've done a lot of research looking at individual differences, um, and I think anyone who's been in a research lab has conducted even a handful of studies gets to see some pretty extreme responses. Um, that is a very I would say different experience than when you were, let's say, before you did your thesis for your master's or your dissertation for your PhD, just reading research when you get probably more focused on uh, means and group norms. So if you could share with me, have you had the experience of seeing people who like Chris Barricat talked about when he came on Iron Culture, who have gained a pretty substantial amount of, I'll say lean mass, while also losing a pretty substantial amount of fat mass in any of the studies you've done? Well, yeah, um, we used DEXA, for example, in my dissertation, and one of the highest responders gained on the order of like four kilograms of lean body mass and lost around two kilograms uh, of fat mass. Um, that's one example, but man, I'll say in my practice so far, so for the past three months, uh, I've been using ultrasound and the, uh, let's see, it's a BIA device. It's a multi, it's the, uh, gosh, not the Impedimed device grant. I just got it recently, but it's a, you use the electrodes. Is it like an RJL quantum? Does it have the adhesive electrodes? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's not the Impedimed SFB7 then? No, no. Vacuumed. RGL quantum. Sorry. It's, oh, it's Vacuumed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, yeah, because I, I shopped around. I, I had another one, didn't like it, didn't think that it was accurate, so I did some retest, like place the electrode, take it off, place it again, get a reading, um, which that's how you do it, right, Grant? Like you guys place the electrodes, test, replace, test again, take the average. Yeah, so we'll often we'll often like place them, run a test, run another test, remove them, replace them, run a test, like switch out electrodes, run a test, 
we're doing some reliability stuff like that right now just to see where those errors are. But yeah, usually like two separate assessments in, in average. Yeah. When I get pretty good reliability from this one, <clears throat> but basically I've been using that device with the ultrasound and using your lab based three compartment model. Uh, like I had messaged you about Grant, I guess it's been a, a couple of months. Um, and using that technique, man, and I'm really careful with the ultrasound. And so I guess I should back up. I'm testing people's body composition using the ultrasound and the BIA device. I use the BIA device to measure body water, and then I use the ultrasound device to measure body fat percentage. But in this case, correct me if I'm wrong, Grant, because I'm following your paper to a T. Uh, I calculate body density from the ultrasound derived measurements. And then I plug that into the equation to get the three compartment estimate of body fat mass, right? So I get fat yes. mass from that. Yeah. yeah. So, so what Cody's doing uh, is better than like all these other individual methods. So if you need someone to test you and you live within seven hours of Alabama, go to, go to Cody for testing. Yeah. Stop by. But what I was going to say is so far over the last three months, using that technique, um, I think about 30 or 40 percent of the clients that I've tested were seeing recomposition. Uh -huh. uh, and they're, you know, most of them are doing some form of a progressively overloaded resistance training program and I think are, are dieting intelligently. And so I think that the most extreme response I've seen so far was like a seven pound increase in fat free mass and like a four pound increase or decrease in fat mass within like seven weeks. Um, so that's awesome. With yeah, with that said, uh, to uh, Chris Barricat's point, man, and the article that they published, kind of aggregating those training studies that pretty clearly show evidence of, of recomposition, um, it can happen. And yeah, I guess to answer your question about extreme responders. Some of these guys that were in my dissertation study, I'm thinking of a few off the top of my head. You could see it, like thinking about what they looked like before they started the training protocol and then how they looked at the end. It was profound, man. Uh -huh. um, just subjectively, like beyond the uh, data that we have. Uh, it was really interesting. So, no, that's perfect. And it's, it's, uh, it's, so I think, you know, like the, those numbers you gave in pounds and number get you, numbers you gave in kilograms are, are pretty similar and very telling. But I think where I want to pitch, pitch it back over to you, Grant, now is you take those same subjects with the same protocol. And if you were to measure them via, say, a four compartment or a two compartment model, what would those two differences might look like? If you could theoretically, you know, think about, okay, we've got someone who, uh, lost X amount of tissue, gained X amount of tissue on, on one measurement, would it look the same on another? And how might the, the device uh, give us uh, more different or more nuanced answers there? Yeah, so that's a great question. And the big picture answer is it depends. There'd be some individuals who would present with very similar body compositions via a two compartment model and a four compartment model, for example. Uh, and I'll define those a little more in a second. And those would essentially be the individuals who are meeting the assumptions that are baked into a two compartment model. But there'd be other individuals who would have very different body compositions via those methods. And largely those would be the people who are violating some assumption that's built into a two compartment model. So with the all the you know many techniques that we, we briefly mentioned, there are two compartment models, as mentioned, those lump all of fat free mass together. Um, so what Cody's doing, for example, in his practice, what he just mentioned, this three compartment model, he's essentially pulling out the biggest single component of fat free mass, which is water and accounting for that. So because he's doing that, he's no longer, you know, of course, there's some error involved in estimating water, um, but he's no longer assuming a constant hydration or water content of fat free mass, which really all two compartment methods are assuming that constant hydration of fat free mass. When we know for a fact there's substantial variability um, between individuals, even within individuals over time, and there are some groups and, and some data that resistance trained individuals are 
uh, one of these groups that systematically deviate from the assumed water content, for example, of fat-free mass. Um, yeah, so to just walk it up from, yeah, we had the one compartment that's all of body mass. These two compartment models, that's just fat mass, fat-free mass, everything else. Going up to a three compartment, you could you could theoretically pull out any compartment within fat-free mass, but the one that's best to do, and again, what Cody's doing is pulling out the water content. So that's kind of your major player there. If you were to go up one step further to a four compartment model, the next compartment you'd normally pull out would be bone. So this is where you'd need like a DEXA assessment. Uh -huh. um, so if we were to do this four compartment model in the lab, what it would look like is we would need a body water measurement, um, ideally via a, a dilution technique, but practically we can use something like bioimpedance spectroscopy. So one of the bio, nicer bio, bioimpedance techniques. So water content there, body density, we would get that from bod pod, but you can also get that from either skin folds or ultrasound. Um, like Cody's doing, uh, and then the bone mass, bone mineral mass, we would get from DEXA. Um, and that's at four compartments. You could keep going. You could estimate soft tissue mineral. Um, you could estimate protein and glycogen content. Um, but as you move beyond three compartments um, and four compartments especially, there, there's really no added benefit for continuing to try to pull out these tiny little compartments. But moving from two to three compartments, again, by accounting for body water, usually improves accuracy pretty substantially. So to get around to answering your question, if you have someone, again, who's meeting those assumptions that are baked into um, the bod pod, you might be able to assess them by the bod pod and by a four compartment model, and they have very similar body fat percentages. And we see this in a, in a recent paper we published. You can look at all the individual data points and, you know, out of 170 people, there's a good chunk who you can look at a very simple method and a multi-compartment model, one of these complex models, and their body fat percentages are like the exact same. So these are likely people who are, who are meeting these assumptions. There are other people who have these enormous deviations um, when we assess them by the simpler methods. For sure. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a theoretical example to where uh, there might be a big difference. So like if we, and, and maybe my assumptions are wrong here, so this might be instructive for me. So if we took a relatively untrained person, we'll say recreational, or maybe the way they train is not very glycolytic, not very glycogen dependent, and they don't have a huge training age, they're not taking any supplements, and they get put on, let's say, uh, a research-based hypertrophy program that has them training with higher volumes, higher reps, closer to failure, and just greater energy expenditure, and they start taking creatine, and they go on a, uh, a, a diet that is given them to by researchers, which is predominantly carbohydrate, when before they're maybe like standard American diet, like a bunch of fat, a bunch of carbs, and then however much protein came from their fat-dominant meat and protein sources. So we kicked their carbs up, we've inclu included creatine, they're doing more glycolytic training, more total volume of training, and now eating in a surplus. We put them in a two-compartment two model versus a four-compartment. Might we see a big difference from the, the water gain in that, in that uh, two-compartment model compared to a three or four? Yeah, you, you likely would, and Cody, you can probably speak to some of the, um, like with the high-volume resistance training and, and maybe fluid shifts, or even, I don't know if we're getting into sarcoplasmic hypertrophy or not, Cody. But, oh, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you certainly could. And um, in, in that scenario, there's clearly some low, low hanging fruit. Like if, if they're notably cho ch changing their glycogen stores, um, the creatine and associated water um, for, for the carbohydrate and creatine, those are things that can acutely um, manipulate estimates. So even if, you know, if, if it's simply, so another example of this would be like if we assess someone when they're fasted and then they, um, drink a liter of fluid and then we assess them again. It depends on the method, but for several methods, they'll be detected as like an instantaneous increase in lean mass, for example. But even if you're doing it in a fasted state, best practices, all of that, then yes, certainly the higher um, water content absolutely could could change the estimates artificially and could also change the level of agreement or disagreement between the, say, two and four compartment models. Totally makes sense. Dr. Hahn. Yeah, piggyback question. Can you, Grant, please talk about the potential error in BIA scales that clients use in bathrooms? Uh, like, you know, they weigh in every day, they get a body fat estimate in the morning. Can you talk about how those measurements can be erroneous and why? You've kind of oh. already covered that. I just, I really would like to share this with people and yeah. bring attention. Yeah. Absolutely. And first, let me just tell a personal story on this exact note. You mentioned in the closet of a gym, 
Uh, most commercial gyms, they have that little handheld BIA device. We used to give at Fitness Together back in Sacramento in 2006, we used to give people this. They, every time they came in, they get a towel and water because hashtag customer service, right? So one, one of these days, I, you know, we steal our own waters all the time. Uh, and I, I checked my body fat percentage and it was like, I don't know, like 17 or 18 percent. And then I grabbed one of the trainers. I was like, watch this. And I slammed two of those waters. I did it again, 13 percent instantly. Uh, and I uh, said, cuts done for the for the year. And uh, so. So, yeah, I guess to piggyback on his piggyback question back to you, Grant. We're just your, we're piggybacking like crazy. Before, before I answer the question, that. I actually have to add a piggyback to your piggyback on his piggyback. Triple piggyback. We, this last year we did, um, so on the, there's a sort of more modern, nicer bioimpedance scale in body 770. Lot, lots of researchers in this kind of sports nutrition realm, body comp realm will uh, utilize this device. So this is one with a, with a scale built in. So what you commonly hear and your, your anecdote supports this, and this, this partially demonstrates the variability of bioimpedance technology. But typically what you would hear is that exact thing. It's like, oh yeah, if you want to like trick BIA, just drink a bunch of water and like jump on there and you'll look super lean. And obviously that, that can happen in some cases. However, we brought people into the lab after a dry fast. So they consumed no food or fluids for 12 hours. We did some baseline assessments um, with this embody analyzer. We had them um, consume a fixed, well, a relative amount of water relative to their, their body mass. We monitored them over a little over an hour. And over that duration with this scale, it was actually detected exclusively as an increase in fat mass. And it's because of this particular analyzer, because it has this scale built in. So it, it could immediately detect the increase, say, you know, um, half a kilo increase in body mass from ingesting all this water. But the currents couldn't yet detect that body water the currents weren't actually um the the fluid had not distributed in the body enough or it was primarily in the trunk which is really difficult for a lot of methods but very difficult for the bioimpedance currents to accurately um estimate tissue within the trunk so we saw the exact opposite that we that we saw artificial increases in body fat of of several percent that were immediate and based on the waste the w increased weight and were maintained over the course of an hour so just kind of an interesting illustration that even within the same and BIA is a big example of this because there's so excuse me so many different devices so many different types of devices um, that it's really hard to generalize even something like that that you assume you'd be able to generalize to other forms so mm -hmm. quadruple piggyback um, unlike uh, <laughs> Eric who they did the assessment and they did it fairly straight up the place that I worked at the big box place that I later left no surprise they would uh, fudge the numbers where there are settings that you could change and so for individuals and unrelated I'm sure the manager at the time was fired for ethical violations whole kind of a big box place was majorly suspect but a lot of individuals they would do their fitness evaluation and those that were basically upset because they felt like they weren't seeing changes trainers or those i forget fitness consultants were basically the people that sold the training were instructed how to fudge the numbers with the device in order to have more favorable results and so they would directly alter uh the output so it wasn't even about trying to like oh drink some water or, or anything that you can alter uh yourself they would just change the numbers and then tell you a fairy tale which i heard is not that uncommon um so I think I take the cake for the most questionable uh, use of, let's say, any body fat measurement tool. Yeah, no, that's yeah, let's, that's pretty bad. Let's hope that that doesn't happen in uh, research. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, here's let me let me ask you this: uh, Can you can you lose fat? without losing weight are you talking about molecular fat or adipose tissue it actually doesn't matter the answer is the same yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> okay can you repeat that yes the answer is yes you can lose fat without losing weight thank you thank you i, I needed <laughs> yeah. good, man the the number of times that i've had that conversation in the past few months uh uh, there's just a disconnect, right? I mean, Grant, what would you say typically masks the loss of, of fat? Like what physi what underlying physiology is occurring that influences body weight that would 
stabilize body weight for multiple days or weeks, although fat mass or adipose tissue is, is being lost. Yeah. So I guess the, the two, and I guess they're sort of re- potentially related, the two that come to mind, one, you know, of course you could be in a, a recomp setting, a recomp scenario where someone could actually be losing fat or adipose tissue or both. Um, and simultaneously gaining lean mass and they'd never see it on, on a scale though, you know, of course with monitoring, like you're doing, or even something simple like circumferences at several locations of the body, you might be able to get that hint where, you know, my body mass hasn't changed, but I see my upper arm circumferences increasing and my waist circumferences decreasing. And I know where I tend to gain and lose body fat. And this probably means I'm losing body fat in my abdomen and potentially gaining, you know, muscle in my upper arm. But beyond that, you, you certainly could have fluid related, um, occurrences that would confound changes in body weight, at least um, tempor- temporarily. Is that sort of the direction you're going, wondering about acute things like like fluid intake, gastrointestinal content, all of that? Yeah, well, and really just bringing attention to the fact that scale weight alone is a limited proxy of success uh, yeah. on the order of, of days in, in a week or two if someone's in a deficit. So like, you know, it's not, I'm Eric and Omar, I'm sure you guys have seen this or experienced it yourself. When you or a client is verifiably in a pronounced negative energy balance, but the number on the scale isn't moving predictably or as anticipated. Um, A lot of people can get discouraged by that, understandably. But one thing that I try to educate people on and have regular conversations about it is the different factors that can influence weight and cause weight to be maintained, uh, although fat mass or adipose tissue is being lost. So like you said, Grant, and then like I, I talked to people about glycogen and associated fluid. That's something I would like to hear your thoughts on, man, because uh, for my dissertation, when uh, Dr. Jordan Moon was setting up the the SFB7 device, we talked a good bit about, and we ran these assays for glycogen concentration eventually, but we didn't actually measure water associated with the glycogen per gram. I really would like to dig into that a little bit more, but it's often assumed, right, that for every one gram of glycogen that you store, you store with it three grams of fluid. What do you think about that? And is that is that a good coefficient? Is that a good per gram retaining value of fluid for every one gram of glycogen? Yeah, three grams is also what I would um, cite. I think there are a few papers showing variability, um, but but I think three grams of water per gram of glycogen is a is a fair estimate. And yeah, that could certainly sort of like you're you're getting that that could certainly um, acutely affect um, body weight and and even body composition estimate. So there's a limitation of body weight here, like you're saying. If um, you know someone is um, say they're because of some dietary change, they're actually increasing their glycogen stores while they're losing body fat. They could see something stable on the scale. Uh, even though they're, you know, hitting their target of losing body fat. But um, but some of these limitations would also be true, not just on the scale, but our assessment method. So if you load or deplete someone, someone's glycogen stores, that's detectable or is detected as lean mass, for example, on the DEXA. So you could have a method like DEXA, which is very well thought of as a standalone method. Um, and you can trick it one way or the other. Again, another way to to do this is with unstandardized conditions where within the course of a day or a few hours, you can do a facet assessment and non-facet assessment, and you see that. Um, but some of those factors certainly could be there after an overnight fast um, as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm at a, a conference. <laughs> I'm at the mic <laughs> questioning you. <laughs> but absolutely, feel free to expand on that. Uh, you, you can answer those questions yourself too, my, 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 my friend, uh, if, if you want to expand on it. Well... I don't have a lot more to add other than like people, a lot of my clients, right? They're consistently weighing in on the scale and we're not testing their body composition every week. Mm -hmm. And when it's not moving in the expected direction or at the rate we anticipate, it's discouraging, right? And people get hung up on that number. 
So uh, I have repeated myself a lot over the past few months, just trying to hammer home like, look, glycogen and associated fluid is typically what I start with because from the, the research that I've done, people can store on the order of around seven grams per pound of body weight in, in glycogen. So just kind of translate that to some numbers for people. If I weigh about 200 pounds, that's 1400 grams of, of glycogen. If I'm saturated, which is about three pounds. And then the associated fluid with that, if it is three grams, you know, that's what another 12 pounds. So that's a, a lot. lot. That's you know, on the order of 15 pounds of weight that could be explained by changes in glycogen and associated fluid, uh, which is almost 10% of my body weight. Um, and yeah, those day-to-day -day fluctuations due to training and changes in carbohydrate intake and fluid intake can mask the change in fat loss when someone is in a, a negative energy balance. And so I start there and then, you know, I often talk about the possibility of body recomposition um, and how you could be gaining muscle tissue, we'll call it, uh, fat-free mass alongside that change in fat mass. And it could mask the expected change in, in fat mass that would show up as a change in your scale weight. Mm -hmm. So I just think that's that's relevant for people to appreciate and then changes in sodium intake and, and like I said, fluid intake uh, can also play a role in that. But yeah. That's huge. I think, can I, can I throw a, a, a reference behind you, my friend? There's a, there's a study by, cause I, I always think about this and this in terms of getting on stage cause you know, the only sport that really matters, right? Uh, flexing in a speedo. Uh, I think about the relationship between glycogen and water and, and muscle fullness and uh, dehydration practices and physique competitors. And uh, there's a really interesting study that was done by Fernandez Elias back in 2015 and colleagues. And it's titled uh, Relationship Between Muscle Water and Glycogen Recovery After Prolonged Exercise in the Heat in Humans. And what they did was they had uh, people cycle until they were, I think, between 4 and 5% dehydrated. Uh, in terms of, I think, I think body loss, uh, body body weight loss, the way they did that, and they had one group uh, consume a fair amount of water uh, with with a a post exercise uh, glucose shake. So they had like 250 grams of carbs with either 400 mils of water or uh, I think like three liters of water, and the the amount of associated water and muscle when they did biopsies after this there was uh, at least three grams per water, so that three three to one ratio that we talked about in the dehydrated, dehydrated group, but it was a one to 17 ratio of muscle water in the group that consumed three liters. Now, I'm not saying that's all like glycogen bound, whether that's you know uh, extracellular or intracellular water, I don't know, but it is muscle water. And I think that's just a really important point. Like um, there can be a ton of associated water to back up what you said, like 10% of your body weight if you include bound and unbound. Uh, associated with glycogen. And if we think about being glycogen depleted or carbing up or being low carb simultaneously along with creatine being dehydrated, uh, that does explain some of the things. If you're familiar in the physique world, especially when you look at heavier competitors go through uh, like a depletion and a loading phase, you see some big changes in body weight uh, that if absolutely you chuck them into some of these, especially two compartment models, there would be some crazy recomps in a crazy physiological state occurring, which would break the brain of most YouTube commenters for sure. Yeah. yeah that's a good point, man. Yep. I like it. What were you going to say, Grant? Oh, I just related to what you're saying. You all could probably provide some perspective on this just from um, working with individuals. But I think that kind of moving in the opposite direction, sometimes individuals can get too encouraged by how quickly weight goes off very early on, particularly if you're lowering, car lowering carbohydrate um, intake, maybe carbohydrate availability, because you, the, the glycogen in associated water is much more labile than body fat itself. So, I mean, this is a classic, there are scientific commentaries on this, lots of people's anecdote supports it, but classic of going on low carbohydrate diet being like, 
this is the best diet ever. I lost five pounds in the first week and it wasn't that hard. And then why is my weight loss stalling already in the second week or the third week? Um, you know, the potential for loss of glycogen, loss of associated with water, and then that stabilizes pretty quickly. And then the kind of grim reality of how slow the fat loss can actually be might, might set in. Mm -hmm. That's great stuff all around. Yeah. I think, um, I think we've done a really good job talking about why we get, uh, not maybe different gross metrics like the scale, but absolutely, uh, something might show an insane body recomp on two compartments and something much more reasonable in, in the realm of body composition. If we were to use, you know, three compartments, uh, knowing how much of that, you know, muscle gain or quote unquote fat loss was, you know, not actual adipose tissue or, or true muscle. So I think we've talked a good bit about, uh, measurements and a good bit about adipose tissue. Before we move on though, I, I want to uh, make sure that the, the unknown unknowns don't creep up on me as a non-expert in this area. Is there more that either one of you want to say about uh, measuring uh, body composition with regard to body fat specifically, or gross metrics of lean mass or fat-free mass, uh, or adipose tissue before we start talking about uh, the muscle? Um, well, not too much. I think any any comments I have would be, would probably come up in the muscle section more related to which methods are actually assessing muscle tissue as opposed to what we've mostly been talking about. So I, I think that will probably come up here in a minute. Cool. And I heard a, I heard a solid well from Cody that sounded like he, he wanted to get into something. So it's common nowadays to publish research and then have it just blasted on the internet by people who've never done research. And uh, I would just like, um, Grant, how much is a DEXA machine? It depends. So you could get it as cheap as um, like 50000 or something if you got one refurbished, but it could go up to over 200000 depending on the, the model. This is the problem with the ivory tower. You just heard, you just heard Dr. Tinsley say as cheap as $50,000. Mm -hmm. I heard it. So as we know, this is the problem with being in the pocket of big body composition. I know the kind of grants you're getting that go directly into your bank account, millions of dollars. And now we understand why we just can't trust Science. The, the quote unquote experts and science yeah. that's out there. Jeez. What yeah. Can I say? Well, and then <laughs> do you have any experience with MRI or um, computed tomography? Yeah. So those yeah. are the ones I wasn't mentioning yet because we're getting into it. I don't personally, we have an MRI on campus that I very much want to use uh, moving forward. I know they charge, I don't know how much the device is, but I know they charge $500 an hour to use it. And I know it's very expensive. Um, I, you may know how expensive they are, but a lot more than a DEXA. Yeah. Yes. And then you, do you have a bod pod? Yes. Right. Yeah. Those are, how much are those running these days? It, around 50 new, I believe around 50,000 new. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the reasons why studies use certain techniques that are more affordable is for that reason, right? These pieces of equipment are very, very expensive. And a lot of researchers are aware that their measurement has limitations. But one of the reasons they don't use those other techniques is because they're cost prohibitive. Um, and I just think it's important for people to realize that with these more affordable techniques, like what you've helped us to put together grant with the field-based three compartment model where you use a, a more affordable BIA device and an ultrasound. Um, it's important that people are standardized with that, right? And we do our best and we try to be reliable and standardize the conditions of those measurements. But we, a lot of us appreciate that there are limitations to that. Uh, and one of the reasons why we don't use other techniques is because they're so expensive. I just wanted to bring attention to how expensive some of those yeah. more advanced techniques are. And I would love to uh, use MRI in every study that I do and, and for the clients that I work with, right? But I'm not going to pay, and I know they're not going to pay $500 an hour or even more. We, we've had it quoted at $1,000 a scan. I think these are really, really important points is it's very easy to be a armchair uh, researcher, when you when you don't understand the limitations of human research and the costs associated with it, and there's absolutely a reason 
why most of the research I've done for body composition has been a combination of skin fold and ultrasound muscle thickness. And that's because that's the most affordable. And uh, a lot of labs don't have uh, the ability to, to pay for more than that. And I think it's like if someone is to actually do some math here and think about what a fully kitted out body comp lab that had every, every, every metric, we'd be looking at close to a million dollars. So yeah, good luck for, for, for bodybuilding research, right? Yeah. And Cody brought up a great, yeah, great point on that. And then even something as simple as, um, say someone wants a DEXA, even if you have the money for it state by state, the regulations vary on who can click that button because it does emit radiation, even though it's a very low falls under the category of background radiation, it's still regulated very tightly in some states. So um, even if you had the money or the institutional support to get one, there's some places where you'd have to have a medical professional there to conduct some of these, you know, fairly straightforward tests. So it just ends up being not only costly, but but sometimes too inconvenient to do it, or you're, you're just not able to not able to do it for other reasons. Yeah. So the last time I checked into that, we we're exposed to more radiation on a cross country flight than we are using a DEXA. Yep. Is that, yeah. Yeah. And the <laughs> nature of performing a DEXA is, oh, I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't say it that way. You have to do, do you do like the fan, do you have a DEXA, right, Grant? Yeah, you yeah. guys have one. So yeah, we got, we do got you guys, that. do you use the phantom uh, calibration stuff? We have the block calibration. Okay. Or, yeah, so, so we don't have, did you have like a, something that looked like a full body? Yeah. Okay, yeah. No, ours is the block base. Like it has the composition estimates built in. Did you have, well, sorry, this is getting into the weeds, but yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm asking anyways, did you have a Hologic or a GE? GE. Okay, yeah. yeah we, we also do. We have an IDEX and a, a Prodigy, but. Okay. And the point of that step, right, is to, can you talk about that, like how you actually calibrate the DEXA and then the information that that provides, or do you guys want to skip to the next topic? Well, I did actually want to ask, is it accurate to call the DEXA the gold standard of body composition? Good question. No. no. <laughs> yes. Just, just wanted to go. make sure you could say it again. Because there is yeah. a very yeah. notable uh, lifter on the YouTubes that claims it is the gold standard and that they are, Eric, I don't want to misquote here, but 6% body fat? You got a DEXA scan. It had to, it had to be. It's the gold standard. So... Open and shut. That's what uh, that's, that's what Alberto Nunez when, was when he got a DEXA when he was in stage condition. It's weird. They look... No, someone's 6% on DEXA, they're very lean. Whether or not they're exactly 6%, you know, it, it depends. But the, the uh, index... Let's just say that Alberto potentially looked a little leaner than who Omar was talking about. <laughs> five, just, about four, five, I'll, I'll six, let you seven take percent, it. Eric. Hey, you know, it's. I'm sure it's the gold standard. <laughs> it's the just gold go standard. Ahead, you, you tell us about this, uh, this device. device. No, just, just index's defense, the... In my mind, the only justification for calling it gold standard would be if you have to, ha and I still wouldn't call it that, is if you have to have the segmental body composition estimates. So our four compartment model gives you total body composition, but not segmental estimates. So there's some applications where, um, you know, say in an athletic situation, you're wanting to monitor segmental body composition pretty closely, which is very difficult to do accurately because the errors for segmental measurements are larger than for the the whole body. Um, but, but in that situation, if you really need the segmental data, then you could make a good case for choosing DEXA over a multi compart model, though you might also want some complementing, um, models to kind of, uh, or, or assessments, even if they're very simple, like skin fold thicknesses or something just for some, some context. Mm -hmm. I think, so one, one question I have before we get onto muscle for you, Grant. So as we get into multi compartment models, we're using multiple devices in, in concert, right? So. I remember, and, and I, I could be misquoting here, like I, I remember looking at the data and feeling like there was a trade-off between accuracy and, and, and error size. So for example, with a dunk tank, the, the plus or minus values, if you actually do it properly and get them to, to, to actually expel their, their, their lung volume and get dunked, it, it's only two compartment model. It is going to miss some of those uh, water changes, and it's going to give you very gross metric compared to, say, a four compartment model. But there's only one error associated with it, as far as I understand. Now, if you were to use multiple devices to get a like a four 
four compartment model. Are you compounding errors there? And is that a worthwhile trade-off? That's a very insightful question. That's a very specific question that's asked by body composition researchers and has largely been answered. Yeah, so the idea is called propagation of error. And, and the question that you asked, and just to restate it, is is the added accuracy worth the added error? Does it actually make up for the fact that you have three different techniques, each with their inherent error? So quite a bit of published data has supported that, yes, it is still beneficial to do so the enhanced accuracy outweighs the error. With that said, uh, in my lab is, you know, um, this semester, even collecting updated reliability data. That is something that ideally every lab using the multi compartment model should assess to make sure with our specific devices and techniques that our propagation of error is low enough to justify using this. Um, but but data from a number of labs have supported that if you run these procedures properly, then yes, the added accuracy is is worth it. Love it. Anything to add on that, Dr. Hahn? Well, I don't know if you guys plan to ask Dr. Tinsley this, but yeah, this is my last question, I promise, for now. You're, you're doing a fantastic job of being a guest host on this episode you're also a part of, which I love. So you just carry on, my friend. You're crushing it. Okay, great. Um, how would you tell us to reliably measure our body composition with limited techniques? Like, do you yeah. have any advice for people? You stole my question, man. Oh, so. Sorry, dude. Yeah, I would, in those situations, there'd be a few things. One, I would accept that there might be in, in if you're the coach in this setting try to communicate to your clients that there might be more useful things to look at than a body fat percentage the percentage is what we want it's what you make the youtube videos about all of that but in in my opinion just some logical interpretation of more raw metrics might be a little more useful so in a very low um resource setting i would recommend um a body mass measurement being part of it um, for every measurement, including body mass, I'd recommend being absolutely anal about standardization. So, I mean, ideally, like nude body mass in the morning, you've voided your bladder, you've been very exact, you've not taken a sip of water yet, just eliminate anything you could do differently um, from day to day, just, you know, be very consistent. I would recommend the body mass measurement, a simple flexible tape measure and some circumferences. Um, of course, here, you might want to plan when you take the circumferences around when certain workouts have been to minimize, you know, any, any localized edema, um, you know, with muscle damage or, or swelling, but I think some circumference measurements, I think, you know, I gave this example earlier. Um, but some of the frustrations about a stable body weight might not be there if you were also taking circumferences of relevant body parts and also had some understanding of like how you gain and lose fat. Um, so again, for myself, if I was, if I was staying the same body mass, my waist circumference was decreasing. I know that's somewhere I might gain body fat but my upper arm circumference was increasing, I can make the logical conclusion. I'm probably not like losing fat in my abdomen and gaining fat in my arm. It's like I've probably gained some lean mass in my arms and potentially lost some fat at this site where I, I tend to lose fat. Um, related to that, you could do either instead of the circumferences or to supplement them, just simple caliper thicknesses. Um, for that, I would be inclined to not even necessarily take all the sites and plug it into a body fat equation, but I would interpret those raw skin fold thicknesses. Yes. You like that one? I love preach, it. Um, preach interpret those us. raw. So, I mean, that's something really cheap. Body mass scale, flexible tape measure, skin fold calipers, and interpret all those metrics raw. And you can see what direction things are trending. Of course, I also recommend interpreting in the context of what training block you're in, how's my performance in the gym, how do I feel, and not making some big program change just because you acutely saw something you didn't like on the scale or even on the circumferences or, or skin folds. I love it. Can I tell a brief story to, 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 to back you up mm -hmm. for our fifth piggy piggyback? As long All as right. it supports what I said, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> I'm here to confirm your biases, my friend. So, um, so speaking of propagation of error, you could take that same lens and look at skin fold assessment. So um, for those who aren't familiar, there's what's called ISAC, the International Society for Sports Kinanthropometry. I think uh, ISAC, I don't understand where, where the A is. I always forget. I guess that's because kinanthropometry. Uh, anthro I, I don't remember what the freaking thing is, <laughs> even though I was actually certified. <laughs> um, so um, they teach you how to take reliable measurements of skin fold at each site in addition to some biochromial widths and some other things. But anyway, um, so at each site there is an error associated with you. 
um, and that is your technical error of measurement. Of course, there's also going to be some fluctuations in, in skin folds. It's a biological error. You can't change that. You can't control it. Uh, well, you can control for it, but you can't change it. So if you think about it, if you're doing, let's say, an eight-site assessment, you are getting the combination of all those errors together with a sum of eight, and that's there. But it's actually quite small. If you're good at taking skin folds, we're looking at like maybe on average per site, 0.5 to 1 millimeter off on, on your skin folds, right? And that adds up to not a whole lot, you know, four to eight millimeters being off. And so you can be like, all right, so long as I see something greater than between four to eight millimeters on my sum of eight, that's a real change. I've either gained or lost uh, skin fold thicknesses to be most accurate and, and eliminating the possibility of mislabeling what that is. However, these skin fold equations are equations that are that you plug that into along with other aspects of, of anthropometry. So for my master's thesis, I had a level one ISAC person uh, who was pretty pretty low uh, TEM, uh, error measurement of each site, and we got the sum of eight skin folds, and then we also, and I did this mostly just to, to prove this point, I chose three different uh, equations that used, I think, seven, seven sites, four sites, and three sites. I can't remember which ones. And the average body fat percentage of these males who were trained um, was 15%, 10%, and 20%, the, the mean difference. As, as the, that's at the group level. So there was a spread of the mean, three different means of, of, of plus or minus 5% from one another or a whole range of 10%. That just gives you an idea of how, you know, those kind of errors can really compound. And that's with doing skin folds well. So just, just for everyone to understand. Yeah. yeah. No, that's a great, yeah, great comment. Yeah. I, I love that you said use the raw data for those. Yeah. Good, good advice. That's what I uh, tell people too. So thank you. Oh, no yeah. problem. No problem. You know, I know others like Bill Campbell, I know, I think is a, is a fan of some of that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a good practice. You know, I have a uh, practical question then for Dr. Cody Hahn, because you're in the trenches uh, now working with the people, you're a man of the people. You're kind of like John the Baptist where you did the damn thing, got your PhD, and then you wanted to spread the good gospel. Um, and I'm curious how you talk to people or what you would say, because you said, man, I've had this conversation too many damn times with people because they want some reliable tool to basically show them that, yes, they're making progress when it comes to the body composition goals, but due to the margin of error and, and so many unknowns, it's kind of hard to say in the short term, the changes. Um, so for everyone listening, because I think we all want to quantify and I think there is a very emotionally charged response to our weight and we all want to get to our desired goal yesterday. And so there's all this extra pressure. And so you're seeing these clients and they're not producing whatever the metric is, isn't producing the desired result. So I guess from you having uh, the you know uh, research background and now kind of taking it to the practical aspect, what does that conversation look like? So let's say I'm your new client because my old coach uh, just was insistent that I was just getting fat, that the 20 pounds I gained, it's like, dude, there's no way in six weeks to gain 20 pounds of muscle. And I don't believe him. So I come to you, we're working together. So what, I'm getting fired is what I'm hearing. I, it was a hypothetical, Eric. It was a hypothetical question. <laughs> we're just dealing with hypotheticals, guys. Um, Got it, sure. So Dr. Han, this person comes to you. What does the conversation look like when someone's desiring those body composition changes but they have to deal with the day-to-day -day either fluctuations or those consequences. So what does that short-term uh, uh, conversation look like for people that, you know, and, and as I'm sure all four of us can relate to this, working with actual humans, man, the first several weeks, that's kind of like the do or die uh, time period. Because if someone doesn't see some sort of tangible results, they're much more, uh, much more likely I would uh, put forth, I would posit, to fall off, right? They don't get kind of that dopamine drip of like, oh, I did a good job. So it's like you got, you need to capture them right then and there. So what does the conversation look like? If you could just say it once, say it loud, it's now codified. You never have to say it again. Uh, well, I can't do that, man, <laughs> because I think it depends on the person, really. And it's a matter of reading how they're doing and the specific scenario. Uh, but what do I usually start with? Well, I, I gently will ask uh, for them to honestly tell me about their their nutrition. So let's stick to fat loss as an example, because that's one of the most common scenarios that I'm dealing with. 
I like to make sure that they're honestly consuming what they are saying they're consuming um, without accusing them of lying at the beginning of the conversation or telling them that they're they're wrong. Uh, but really just trying to explore, is there any potential source of error in your intake, like your reported intake? So like I use uh, chronometer software. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that. Oh, yeah. 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 So, you know, I can see some of that information. And when the numbers don't add up, uh, I kind of know. But I want to talk to them about it. and get a feel for their reaction. Uh, but I would say step one is let's try and make sure that your measurements and your logs are accurate. And from there, that's when I'll usually go into the potential sources of influence on their body weight. So things like glycogen change and associated fluid, the possibility of gaining muscle tissue. Um, now that's unlikely to explain the magnitude of change in weight that we typically see on the order of a day or two. And I go into that and kind of share some calculations on, look, you know, this is roughly the amount of muscle that I would expect you to gain from uh, a session, a resistance training session on the order of a few days. Uh, and I kind of mathematically demonstrate how small that is uh, and talk about how there's likely other sources of influence here that are, you know, affecting your, your scale weight. But, man, in my experience, main thing is step one. Um, people, including myself, uh, at times before I really got used to it and um, got used to measuring and tracking, et cetera, are not very good at estimating the amount of calories and macros and food without measuring it if they've never done it before. So that one usually takes care of the problem. Uh, but when I see, you know, a thousand calories consumed and I'm confident they're expending 2,000 to 2,500 calories and that's logged for seven days or so, and their their weight hasn't budged. Eh, I don't know. Uh, is it possible? Maybe, but unlikely. Right, right. Well, a lot of water retention. Yeah. As a very a as a quick aside, Eric would know this person. I'll just say, yeah, I need. Um, there is an individual that we know where back in the day with my fitness pal, you can enter in. Uh, custom food items. And so he was Percy once again, because we know if you're not assessing, you're guessing. And he attempted to estimate the amount of calories in a slice of pizza that he had. And let me just say for those that are aware, it's basically a standardized slice of, let's say, a, a large pizza. So, you know, think of a number in your head. And he put in there <laughs> 200 calories was his custom entrance. And he and he said and he was dead serious where he's like, yeah, it's like a small slice. And I don't think he was knowingly attempt, attempting to lie, but just how, you know, when you're new to this and you have no idea kind of what you're saying, uh, Cody, you, the margin of error could be huge if you're just guesstimating, so to speak. Well, I'm assuming this was a thin crust, microwavable, right. cheese only pizza because then that fits in the microwave, <laughs> then you nailed it. It's perfect. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah. It's bobbly. Um, I will say quickly, Grant and and you guys too, Eric and Omar. I, what so like if we have someone that starts out at like forty to fifty percent body fat, all right, and I mean against the background of a let's say they're being totally honest and they're consuming around a thousand calories below their total daily energy expenditure, and let's say we've measured their metabolic rate with a metabolic cart or a metabolic analyzer. So we know, let's say in this example, their resting metabolic rate is 1500 calories and they're exercising for about an hour a day, expending another 300 calories or so. So let's just round numbers and say 2000 calories, total daily energy expenditure, and they're consuming 1200. So let's say net energy availability of around a thousand. 
Do you think it's possible that weight could be maintained for several weeks? And the, the reason I'm asking is, from an energetic standpoint, could an individual mobilize enough energy from fat stores and use that energy and you know their organ systems and muscle, et cetera, and be growing an amount of muscle mass or expanding their fat-free mass to the point that it would mask fat loss for several weeks? I would say yes to the first question, no to the, 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 the clarification. So yes to the first question could be a very high level of stress, increase in glycogen storage with associated water while losing fat mass, and also going on a more volumetric-based diet. So they're eating a crap ton of uh, fruits and vegetables and then just lean, pr lean protein, mostly vegetables, um, to eat those 1,200, and then also experiencing some pretty gnarly constipation in the process. Um, yeah, a couple weeks, but then it'll, it, it, I mean, it, it, it will start going down after that. But will, will it be fat-free mass? Will the growing fat-free mass to that extent and everything else stays the same? I don't think that's possible, even if you were on all the anabolics in the world. Okay. What do you think, Grant? Yeah, no, I, I feel similarly. Um, I mean, I, I think there are some factors that might like narrow what, what the energy deficit seems to be. Um, if you're getting to the level of like what, you know, what activity factor are you using for this individual? Are they spontaneously moving less throughout the day because they're calories have been cut some of those, you know, behavioral adaptations that would affect energy expenditure. But, but as you laid it out, yeah, I agree with what Eric said that, that, that seems unlikely. Well, definitely unlikely that you'd have such an increase in the call it lean mass, um, to offset that, but within the realm of possibility that that could happen for a period of time, but, but it couldn't continue to happen for, I mean, several weeks is already a decent bit, but I would assume couldn't continue to happen for a month or longer without there being some like error in some component of it, whether it's on the di excuse me, dietary intake side or or some other assumption or, or calculation or something. And do you guys think that that's related to the maximal rate of fat loss relative to the maximal rate of muscle growth? Like, is fat easier to lose than muscle is to gain? I think so. Absolutely. I think because um, one is not prior adaptations have a much lesser effect on fat loss than they do muscle gain. Like if we look at uh, well-trained individuals, um, tr gaining muscle takes a long time. And if we look at someone who is like, th there's nothing that will like you can slow down your energy expenditure, but I'm not aware of any adaptations that make you unable to actually tap into fat stores besides pretty strange clinical conditions. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure there is some rate limit of fat metabolization that, you know, like if you have a very small amount of fat, you wouldn't be able to tap into it all but really, really quickly. But in the example you gave to someone who is 40 to 50% body fat, um, they can access a whole lot. Yeah, we'll put a pin in that one. I think that one's interesting. But just like basically, is, man, yeah. the, the the rate limitation of fat loss, like just just like you can only build a certain amount of muscle mass per day, right, and accrue a certain amount of muscle protein, you can only lose a certain amount of fat per day. And the rate at which the latter occurs from the research that I've done uh, is a lot quicker, like the maximum rate that that can happen compared to the process of muscle growth. Um, but when you, yeah, I'll, I'll put a pin in that. We can we can talk about that another time. I love it. I mean, this, this guy's yeah. looking for a, for for a, for a repeat on, on iron culture, and and we're going to yeah. be happy to give it to you. Oh yeah, yeah. So I think we're 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 starting to move deeper into the weeds, which is perfect. Because I think we have talked about a lot a lot of the practical stuff, and I kind of we front loaded that talking about measurements, understanding research versus practical reality, different ways of measuring things, and the differences between adipose tissue, fat mass, lean body mass, and muscle mass. Um, so I think most of the practical stuff, I think, we've sorted. And now the nerds are hanging, and that's all of us. And there's plenty in the cult, don't get me wrong. So while understanding 
the the maximal rates of, of fat loss, muscle gain, and potentially uh, the, the the intricacies of skeletal muscle anatomy and the differentiation between skeletal muscle fat-free mass and lean mass may not change anyone's program tomorrow. I think it'd be really fun to talk about. So the floor is yours. You can take that pin out, Dr. Han. Do your thing. Well, what would you like for me to talk about first? Just the general structure of muscle and how hypertrophy um, isn't as clear cut as we might think. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> wow, that's you got, such you a got, you, you piqued my interest. Yeah. <laughs> well, so uh, I'll start with just like the overarching structure, right? We have uh, a muscle that's bundled or, or sheathed in fascia, so connective tissue. And then you have a bunch of muscle fibers in there. And from a whole tissue perspective, muscle is about 75% fluid. Notice I said about, right? So we just talked about how it's not always that. And when we actually take a muscle biopsy sample and weigh, take the wet weight and then dehydrate it and calculate the amount of water that basically the hydration status of the, the muscle cells. When I did that, we did, gosh, a ridiculous amount of those to publish some of my dissertation data that we were talking about earlier. And we, you could see a range of about 5% in either direction. Uh, so it's not always that, but general composition per, by percent, about 70% fluid. So we zoom into the individual fiber level, and you have a cell membrane, call that the sarcolemma. And within that individual muscle fiber, which tends to run the length of the entire muscle, but you have some fibers that can terminate actually close to the belly. Uh, they don't all run the entire length of the muscle, but just in this example, let's imagine a, a muscle fiber that runs the length so it joins the tendon at each end, so at origin and, and insertion. And yeah, just to be clear, you know, that fascia, a connective tissue that bundles the muscle joins to bones via a tendon. And we have this nice muscle, zoom into the individual muscle fiber, sarcolemma, zoom in further. You kind of have these little mini muscle fibers that are called myofibrils. Uh, so they're like thread-like, rod-like structures inside of the muscle cells. And those myofibrils, and this is not really clear, but from our research, we found that around 85% of the space in a muscle fiber is consistent or it consists of myofibrils. And in those myofibrils, you have your sarcomeres, which are the smallest functional unit uh, of a muscle cell. And that's where the contractile proteins are. Uh, and that's where really the magic happens, right? Where the interaction between myosin and actin occurs that actually pulls the, the Z disk together and pulls the structure of the muscle together and generates contraction. Right. So beyond the myofibrils, we have another 15% of space inside of the muscle fibers that we have to explain. So what's in there? Well, uh, some enzymes, uh, some metabolic enzymes, things involved in producing energy, uh, the so ATP, the uh, mitochondrial reticulum, as I think it is pretty clear now that it's probably not these bean-shaped organelles that we've often referred to as the powerhouses of the cell. It's probably more like a reticulum. And then we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and so the sarcoplasmic reticulum is where calcium is released and, and calcium is required to actually allow the cross-bridge cycling process to occur and contraction to occur. So 85, roughly, percent myofibrils, around 15% of the sarcoplasm, the mitochondrial reticulum, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And so traditionally, the understanding of muscle hypertrophy, or really the description of the process of muscle hypertrophy, went something like this. If you take a muscle biopsy, and you see an increase in the cross-sectional area of those muscle cells. So we get a piece of muscle out, 
we slice it into thin slices, we put some on a microscope slide, and we see an increase. So you like the claw mm-hmm. that you see an increase in the size of those muscle fibers. And the idea is that the proportions that I just mentioned, the 85% and the 15% would be maintained as the cell grows. It's a fair concept, right? Well, I was curious about that as part of my PhD research. I, I wanted to know, well, is that true? And like, does that happen? And this is something that I talked to Dr. Mike Stone, one of my mentors in, in my master's degree about, and he did a whole series on uh, the physiology of hypertrophy. And we talked about, quote unquote, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and the idea that the cell, muscle cells could grow, but be like the myofibrillar number or size could be maintained and the growth could be explained by the expansion of the fluid and some of those other cellular components like the mitochondria and the sarcoplasmic reticulum and enzyme abundance etc and so and and others uh, like zatsiorsky and kramer i think it's in their book science and uh, science and practice of strength training mm-hmm. they they have an image kind of showing how that looks so I knew about it, but I really wanted to dig into like actual human samples and see what, what was going on in response to the project that I did, which was really high volume training study, mostly using light load. So 60% of one rep max for sets of 10 reps going from like 10 sets a week to 32 sets a week per exercise. So a lot of volume. Um, and what we found is that the density of actin and myosin, which are the two contractile proteins, uh, seemed to decrease in the the biopsy samples. And we found that the sarcoplasmic protein concentration seemed to increase in response to that high volume routine. And so we characterize that as sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Um, And so, why does that matter? What does it mean? What are the implications of it? I think that we have a lot more work to do. You know, this is one study from one lab. We need other labs to do similar work and use similar methods so they can show that we were wrong or hopefully right. Um, we're totally open to that. I mean, we we just want to figure out what's going on. Uh, but to me, uh, doing the assays extremely carefully very carefully because i didn't believe it like when we did the first round i was like dude there's no way uh we did something wrong and man i mean we've really tried to and shout out to dr michael roberts uh because he was the one he was we call him the molecular jedi uh he developed a lot of the unique assays that really hadn't been done before to help answer these questions. And I I have confidence that we we did a pretty good job and that that's that's what we found. So yeah, so my point is, I guess overall, a muscle cell can grow in response to training without necessarily increasing in myofibrillar protein concentration or content. So the fluid portion of the cell, the sarcoplasmic protein concentration, so things like glycolytic enzymes that would help you make more energy, more ATP, uh, enzymes like creatine kinase, things like that, uh, and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is, again, the side of calcium really important for muscle contraction, right? It would make sense that those fractions, those constituents of muscle cells could increase, and that would be favorable for the cell, right? To me, with a high-volume routine that involves a lot of metabolic flux, it would make sense that the cells would adapt that way, uh, at least in the initial stages. And so we wrote um, another review article and we sneaked the word unicorn into the title. I don't know if you guys have seen that one. Excellent. Uh, I think that's, yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> what you required say? reading for my class. Cap the readings okay, from the lab. Man. You're in so good. Yeah. Thanks, man. Um, and so, yeah, and that we talk about like, sort of a we take a deep dive into physiologically speaking like why would this happen and if i were to simplify it i think that one potential reason 
is to expand the space in a muscle cell that can be backfilled with myofibrils. So like when you're going to build a house, right, what's the first step? You grade the, the area, you clear out everything, you create space to pour the foundation, right? So I think that that could happen at the cellular level when we resist and strain. Um, or you, especially in untrained people, but if you're introducing a, a novel resistance training program to someone, uh, I think that that kind of makes sense, right? You could prepare the space to fill up with myofibrillar proteins on the order of maybe four to six weeks. My study was six weeks. I think a second reason could be related to uh, energetically priming the cell. So if you if you have more of these enzymes that can help you produce ATP, muscle protein synthesis is an energetically expensive process. Uh, now, how much energy? Eric, you, you guys have written about this. I think the Slater article is tremendous. Uh, I don't think that we really know exactly how many calories are required to synthesize myofibrillar proteins, but I think we agree in general as a community that it does cost energy. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so if you increase the cell's capacity to make energy, to make ATP, that makes sense physiologically, right? So you, you provide the, the enzymes and some of the molecular machinery uh, for example, ribosomes, right? We, that's kind of a hallmark adaptation at this point to resistance training. We see typically see increases in the number of ribosomes in muscle cells. And those are the organelles that actually translate messenger RNA into proteins. And technically those ribosomes, they can be in different regions of the cell, but some of them are in the sarcoplasm. Uh, and, you know, that could increase uh, the measurement of sarcoplasmic protein concentration in the short term. And that makes sense to me. You increase your translational capacity. Um, Dr. Hahn, mind if I, can I say something just because I think I, I, this is so valuable what you're saying. And I think a lot of people may need a paradigm shift in how they think about physiology to fully understand it. And what I mean by that is that when I first started reading a lot of this stuff, because the concepts are, concepts are so abstract because we're talking about a micro universe that we never physically see unless you've got a microscope, a lot of it we don't ascribe physical properties to, even though that's almost kind of something that's implicit. We never come out and say, I don't think there's any molecular mass to these proteins. So that, that's not what we're saying, but we don't think of it that way. Like we know that enzymes, you know, do their job as, as catalysts. And we know that these various uh, organelles do things in the cell but because they're small and we, we think about their function but not their physicality, we often forget that we live in a physical world. Like if you do energetically based training and it requires you to have all this related energetic you know, enzymes and organelles that takes up space and it has mass and it will result because you have billions of these things in your body that it will result in an actual change at the gross tissue level that's visible even though you're not technically gaining, you know, actin and myosin contractile tissue. So I, I, I hate, I hated to interrupt you because you're, you're spitting fire on the mic right now, but I just wanted to kind of help people to not think about some of these physiological processes as just, you know, sciencey hand-waving magic that's occurring, but it actually has mass weight and takes up space. I think that's just a useful um, kind of understanding to, 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 to color your, your beautiful drawing that you're putting in grayscale at the moment. Beautiful. And I think the deeper um, philosophical point that you could make is just because you can't see something doesn't mean it isn't real. Um, <laughs> the earth is flat. Carry on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think that the third reason that it makes sense is a lot of the myofibrillar proteins, speaking to your point on molecular mass, are large. They're very large. Uh, a lot of amino acids have to be assimilated and put together, and that would require more energy. And theoretically, that would place a greater transcriptional burden on the nuclei of cells in the cell overall. 
And again, it makes sense to me that you would prepare the space. You would prepare the cell for those energetic needs. Um, so I think that those three things, man, um, help explain why this might make sense, but not everyone agrees with us. Uh, hopefully, instead of disagreeing alone, people will go into the lab and, and do some research and help us figure it out. Uh, but that's where we're at right now. Uh, I'm open minded, but I think, you know, practically speaking, man, um, going back to like the 80s, like McDougal uh, published a study that showed in bodybuilder fibers using transmission electron microscopy, which is like the most elegant microscopy that we can currently do, to my knowledge, where you can zoom in to like 100,000 X and visualize the sarcomeres in a muscle cell. He used that and argued, like this is what, 38 years ago, uh, that in bodybuilder fibers, even though they were significantly larger than untrained individuals' fibers, the amount of space occupied by the myofibrils um, was actually lower than the individuals that were untrained that resistance trained for six months. Uh, in other words, like it was a snapshot of what chronic training could do potentially. Um, and the idea is, and then the, this is, uh, let's see, another study from Meyer et al. It's, I think, M E I J E R. They've measured the um, specific tension of bodybuilder fibers, which is like the, the f amount of force produced per uh, micron squared. So, and they've shown that with bodybuilder fibers, they're larger than an untrained person, but the specific tension actually appears to be lower. Uh, so if myosin and actin are the contractile proteins, right, that are involved with force production at the molecular level, then if myosin and actin density scaled with fiber size consistently in response to training, we would expect for specific tension to be maintained as the cell grew. But there's research that suggests that that's not the case. Um, so, yeah, we'll see uh, what happens. But, yeah, that's uh, that's where we're at right now. Omar, I, I don't know about you, but I just had like a couple nerdgasms uh, throughout that whole discussion. I, I loved it. Uh, I, think, I thought that was really informative. It, it, at the very least, like I said, interesting, if not necessarily directly applicable to anyone's training right now. I don't know about you. <laughs> I gotta be honest, this son of a bitch pulled a Socrates. Okay, this is one of Plato's dialogues here, where it's the classic uh, format. He begins, Cody, in our podcast, asking questions, just asking questions, the Socratic form, coming to a better understanding. To be honest, he knows the answers, but he wants someone else to arrive to that conclusion. So he asked the questions. And then at the very end, he's like, all right, listen, you little shits, here's what it's actually going on right here. And just gives like a brain dump. <laughs> yeah. And I can I just say, Cody, my man. So you have a memorable name, and this is no joke, I'll say this very quickly, that Eric often will cite, you know, references, studies, and so forth. And Dr. Cody Hahn, because the name's just memorable, has rung out, and it's just a very cool full circle moment. And I also have heard Grant Tinsley. Now, Cody Hahn just sounds to me personally like we got some Khan, Noonien Singh, Wrath of Khan type of shit going on, where it just sounds like a Star Trek name, you know, like there's Command, there's uh, Jory LaForge, you got Khan, Noonien Singh, Lieutenant Cody Hahn. So I heard it, I had this idea in my head, it has exceeded I expectations. I think he crosses the multiverse. Yeah, the I mean, <laughs> Han Solo, bro. He, bro. He's not only is he Star Trek, but he's also Star Wars. <laughs> and those are two, two, two cults that typically don't get along. Yeah. But today... The Iron Cult has not only unified our understanding of body composition and all lifters, but also unified Star Trek and Star Wars. So if you if that's not enough for you, dear listener, I don't know whatever will You'll be. You'll never be satisfied. We've it's got, on you. Yeah. We've got phasers <laughs> and lightsabers going against each other. We've got uh, Jedis fighting Klingons here, and we have an understanding of adipose tissue and skeletal <laughs> muscle hypertrophy. So, geez. Hey, and I'm Grant. 
I, I want to hear Grant, my man, because I know he's just been listening the last 20, 30 minutes. I will just say, I know this episode was successful because our guests are like, yeah, cool. Okay, here's how long we could talk. And then, and we're cognizant, myself and Eric. So we're just sitting back being silent, like not asking quite, letting them talk. And they're like, no, we could go on for another 20 minutes. Like, no, let's do this. Like they extend their own deadline they put in. So I know they're in it as well. So Grant, I, I just want to give you some space, my man, to also talk about anything you want. We'll wrap it up. We'll continue this. We'll have the Enterprise, the Millennium Falcon. It's happening. Yeah, no, um, it's been it's been a great chat. I want to just mention one thing I really like that Cody said was this idea of a snapshot. So, I mean, that's the interesting thing about body composition at the the whole body level all the way down to the molecular stuff that Cody was just describing. It's a snapshot in time that reflects everything that's ever happened prior to that moment. So your body composition reflects your net lifetime accumulation of nutrients, other substances. But we're looking at just at a, at a point in time, even if we're tracking someone, say, for a research study, and we're tracking them for several months, that's still just a small series of points in time, you know, maybe three points in time. So if we do like a pre, mid, and post assessment. Um, and it's just fascinating because we, we have this snapshot, but it reflects everything, not only long-term changes in tissue, but some of these acute factors we talked about. It's like, what did you eat yesterday? Like how much carbohydrate have you eaten in the last few days? Are you taking creatine? Just some of these more labile components. But when we run them through a method, we get a number. And this is a caution as well. We get a number and it's easy to interpret that number as this is gospel truth. This number is exactly what it is. And, and we talked about this previously with the error and uncertainty involved. We, we just have to view it a little bit cautiously at any level because it is a, a snapshot in time. Well said. Well, and... So, can you just briefly mention the? Sorry, guys. No, go, yeah, go, no. I, I got to get this yeah, one in. Carry on. Sorry, I love you. S sorry, Grant. Um, no, I don't mind it. Making the, me feel special today. You are special, man. You're the guy. You're the body comp dude. Uh, and you're bald like me. So we are. Got to stick yes, together. Yes, bald brothers. Um. Within subject body composition monitoring. So when you take these snapshots, let's say you you have someone that does a DEXA scan. What do we expect in terms of like kilogram range? Can you just give like a, a reasonable amount of variability on like a DEXA scan within a person? Yeah, so it, it's a little bit difficult to say. So there are individual level error metrics you can get. And some people will say, you know, you should interpret the value they got plus or minus this individual level metric. And there are a few ways to do that. Some, um, I don't want to go too far in the weeds on like stat stuff, but but a common one, just an overall error metric could be like the standard error of the estimate. Um, but an individual level metric that's commonly used is like the 95% limits of agreement. And you'll see very large limits of agreement even on DEXA compared to a multi-compartment model, you could easily see four or five percent. Um, now, what I think you could interpret that and be like, oh, you know, you can't really know what your body comp is. You get a DEXA body fat of 20 percent. You could be 15 or you could be 25. But what I think isn't fully resolved is how much of the, the variability that we attribute to individual variability, how much of that is stable within one particular person over time and how much of it isn't. So we know that it's not entirely stable because you can have things like differences in fat-free mass characteristics that would um, vary over time, even within an individual. But it's very likely that that there is some amount of inherent difference between people that is also captured in that error metric. So it's difficult to say, um, but on the individual level, it is fairly hard to be truly confident a change has occurred. So that kind of goes back to what we we're talking about on the other side of things from DEXA, the very practical side with things like skin fold circumferences, all of that. Um, even if even if someone's getting a DEXA scan done, I would recommend interpreting it holistically and cautiously um, and in the context of, you know, what else is going on in the gym nutritionally um, with these basic metrics. Even if someone has access to DEXA, I would say you should be taking some of these other complementary measures because you could easily get on a DEXA and for whatever reason that day, it looks like you've gained several percent body fat, which is within um, the individual level error. And it could cause you to rethink everything and redo a bunch of stuff on your program when you really don't need to be. Um, so it's hard to give an exact number. I could, I could give it um, again, you know, like say plus or minus 5% on the 95% limits of agreement, which is a pretty high standard or on the standard error, the estimate, you know, it could be, it could be lower um, at, at a few percent. Um, 
but even at, even with those metrics, you have to in, for an individual. I think you have to interpret it a little bit cautiously and not just by, blindly trust those metrics. Um, understand there is some error involved. Some of that is specific to the person. Some of that um, could change over time. Okay. That's my two cents on it. Yeah. So three to five percent ish. Yeah, and and vary some based on the stuff. Even even saying Dex, I mean, they're different scanners, different software versions, all this. So if you look throughout history, you, you can see some very different measurements, not only because of DEXA, but because of the, say, even if they're all comparing to four compartment model, which four compartment model equation are you using? Like which methods did you use to get your body water estimate, to get your body volume estimate, all of that? What is your particular lab's propagation of error for the four compartment? So um, it is pretty difficult to generalize. I have a little more confidence in like the data we have in our lab. If I know what our limits of agreement are for our DEXA and we're assessing someone, I can um, you know, state it a little more confidently because it's the exact same piece of equipment and we're doing it this out the same way. But it's a little harder when you branch out from there and say like, oh, okay, you got a DEXA done on a Hologic scanner at some facility in New York and I have my GE scanner here and we do things a certain way in Lubbock, Texas. So yeah, <laughs> just lots of lots of things that could could go wrong, I guess. This was hey, fun. It was a blast. And and let me just say I appreciate both of your contributions, both of your time and energy. I think people will learn a ton. This might be one you should listen to twice, folks. Um, so again, just want to thank you both. And with that, Omar, do what you do and, and lead us gloriously into, into success, into the sunset, mm -hmm. riding along the, uh, the, the USS Millennium Enterprise yeah. uh, across to the next galaxy. If I learned one thing today, that would be to both avoid the Borg and the Empire. So I just want to thank our guests, uh, Grant Tinsley, Cody Hahn, that deep dive, going all the way in, cranking up well past 11. If you enjoyed this episode and you thought to yourself, huh, I don't understand it, that's okay. Listen to it again. If you still don't understand it, listen to it again a third time. And do us a favor, leave us a rating and review on iTunes. We're So Grant... Cody, you're in the research space. You probably don't realize this, but we're the number one fitness podcast, but we're the number 47 uh, health and fitness podcast on iTunes. That's because rank one through 46 is from uh, sexual health podcast. It's a very tough category. So individuals can help us out by leaving a rating and review on the iTunes. We will be reading them. We do enjoy reading them. If you're on YouTube, you made it all the way to then. You could go ahead and leave a comment. We do our best to respond. We appreciate everyone listening to every single episode. Our guests, their social media, their information linked in the description. And we'll catch everyone every single Monday now until, you know, well, you know.